Right, good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Martin, and I want to talk to you about supply chain security in containerized systems. Um, I also have uh, Mark Kaczowski from Google to thank, because we have been working on this together. We will present it um, later together, but you couldn't be in Berlin today. So, um, I'm a founder at Control Plane, which is continuous infrastructure security and DevSecOps flavored things for containers and Kubernetes. And um, I've done a little bit of everything from development, database administration, pen testing, architecting. And I want to talk about supply chain security and how we can lock down things that we may not know about. So, what is a supply chain? It's anything that we depend upon. So, for example, in a military situation, every piece of hardware and software has to be attested against the person who built them to protect against, for example, nation-state attacks. Um, pharmaceutical companies, likewise, need to know where every uh, need to know the provenance of every part of their uh, supply chain because people are ingesting these things. And of course, kittens need their next treats. The supply chain for these kittens isn't just the hand that feeds them, but it's also the distributors of the frisky bits, the warehouse they were in before home delivery, the manufacturers, the farmers that raised the chickens, the food that those chickens were fed. So supply chains can be really long and really difficult to track. And when there are no guarantees that the upstream supply chain is competent, tracking where things came from becomes even more important, especially if we're feeding the emperor's cats. So how does this relate to software? This is grossly oversimplified, of course, but ultimately, it's any code that ends up running in production um, and with modern development and deployment processes, of course, with CI CD pipelines in the middle. Software supply chains can be exploited. So bugs in libraries that our applications depend upon, for example, Equifax and Struts. Deliberate vulnerabilities snuck into popular dependencies either in the source code or compromising the hosting service or the infrastructure provider, or perhaps a compromised download, a man-in-the-middle attack, or typo squatting, which is especially popular now. It's when, for example, uh, a library which is hyphenated is then re-uploaded without the hyphen, so there are two parallel versions. People can happily resolve that dependency. It's got exactly the same code, and once it's got 100,000 downloads a day, they paste in, or they add some code which, for example, captures the environment and posts it off to a remote endpoint. That means if you're on a build server and you're deploying to production, your build keys are being posted remotely. So when we talk about supply chain security, we're talking about protecting against all of these. The Equifax hack was the exploit of a vulnerable struts library, of course, and compounded by perimeter-focused network policy that allowed database access and subsequent exfiltration. Um, we have also discovered recently that they had a TLS intercepting middleware box, or middle box rather, that had an expired TLS certificate and failed open by default. So they were doing deep packet inspection on all their database traffic, but the, the hardware failed open by default because of an expired certificate. Marvelous. Um, so yeah, detecting vulnerable struts libraries, however, would have mitigated against that in some ways, um, just through scanning dependencies. These were published CVEs, they were well known. And then a malicious but legitimately signed version of CCleaner, which is a Windows cleanup tool, was delivered to users via the official download servers sometime in 2017. The signing keys could have been compromised at multiple points in the pipeline. And a similar attack happened with Kingslayer. A signed but malicious binary was distributed. So, a compromise in the weakest link is game over for users. Point solutions are not enough. TPM, Git signing, binary signing, network encryption, and reproducible builds are examples of point solutions. Signing needs PKI and roles. Reproducible builds assume trusted inputs. Uh, binary signing, we still have key management problems. And um, an untrusted artifact deployed despite best efforts in the pipeline is, uh, again, potential game over. So compliance is still a problem. And how can we make sure that all actions were actually performed by the right party on the right artifacts, and they also produce the right results. So as we know, VMs don't offer the same portability as containers. Um, they tend more to manual adjustment of in-place 
monolithic apps with configuration management. Containers make things a lot easier because of the dream of immutability. Uh, we're essentially running in production the same artifacts as we're building on our local machines, with the exception, of course, that we're probably running a different kernel version. The networking is probably slightly different, and our configuration is also slightly different. But those things aside, we have a lot more homogeneity than we have ever had in time. Containers are meant to be immutable. They're meant to be frequently redeployed. But what isn't solved? Dependencies, process execution at runtime, for example, also mounting hosts parts in from the host, which is breaking out of the mount namespace, um, for example, certificate bundles, um, and the configuration of the file systems that we bundle inside the container images. So these are the theoretical stages of the pipeline. Um, unfortunately, security needs to be baked in. As we know, the shift left mentality um, suggests that we bake it in as early as possible. So. What can we do at the stages of the pipeline? We start off with controlled base images. Um, any external images, for example, things that come from the Docker Hub, should be pulled, re-tagged, pushed into a local registry where they can be subject to your organization's internal compliance requirements. They can be scanned for CVEs on a regular basis. And, uh, and we're not just essentially piping to bash, which is just what pulling from the Docker registry can be. Attacks on image tags. Image tags in the same way that git tags reference an immutable content hash of the Merkle tree. It's exactly the same for Docker image tags. The latest tag is mutable, can be changed, is not guaranteed to be pointing to anything at any given point in time. Hashes are secure, tags are transitory and a possible risk. Uh, of course, we need to statically analyze code um, in IDE, ideally. And at this point, we should be analyzing our dependencies. So this includes pulling down feeds from popular package managers like NPM. Um, all the major uh, programming languages have one. And ensuring that when teams are checking those for vulnerabilities and marking them as insecure in the same way uh, that will be done for operating system packages, we actually pay attention and we upgrade those libraries. Um, once again, we can denormalize them into a local cache like Artifactory or Nexus and apply our controls within the boundaries of our organization. So, not quite the same as perimeter security, but rather control of dependencies. Then we want hermetic builds. This is about, again, not pulling directly from the internet. It also means no inter-build data leakage. For example, Jenkins build slaves sharing a single Docker socket are giving access to all of the other build images and all of the other layers of those images that have been built. So even if one adds a secret in a layer and then squashes the final layer, there is still evidence of that secret lying in part of the UnionFS file system on disk. Um, of course, again, we're caching these build dependencies. Pinning versions for deterministic builds is somewhat divisive because, first of all, most package, uh, most repositories will remove the previous version when they upgrade it to something else kind of depends on, on which uh, package manager you're using. But generally, this means that if a version of a dependency is updated, then our builds will just break. Now, arguably, that's better because we're taking an upgrade path that we know about. On the other hand, we can kind of trust Semver to some extent, and there is a limit to the amount of effort that it is worth investing in these things in order to actually know the upgrade of, for example, core utils. Maybe we care about that because we've got a really heavy bash-dependent application, and they've changed the output of ls to include slashes, as caused quite a ruckus a couple of years ago. But do we really, do we really care about that? So deterministic builds with containers is, uh, is a question of, I think, um, organizational uh, capability to, to actually go and individually upgrade things manually. Um, of course, we would be remiss not to mention bash safe mode at this point in time. Um, it's all very well having these builds, um, having everything wired together in build chains, but of course, if we're running bash without exit on error, without set pipe fail, then, uh, then we are at risk of running untested code paths. And of course, rootless builds. Um, Docker has been heavily criticized over the years for running a root daemon, which means that a breakout um, and a code execution in the daemon's context is executing on the host as roots. Rootless builds are a halfway house towards this. They, they mean that privilege is not required to, uh, to build containers. Now, this has been 
really hampered by the fact that user namespaces are not really up to snuff. Um, however, there is a new breed of tools from, in this case, SUSE and Jess Fraz and uh, Red Hat and Google that all more or less do the same thing, which is remove the requirement for uh, root to build Docker images. Um, although the class of build time attacks that they're mitigating against are more best practice than in the world right now. So where are we? Application image scans. We should be ensuring that we're not shipping CVs to production, of course. This is for operating system components, installed binaries and jars, tarballs, um, in some cases, many more things. Policy, we care about discretionary access controls. There's no point shipping um, these very secure images if we use set GUID or set user on, the, on binaries, because that is a classic old school path to exploit privilege escalation. Um, and of course, secrets and configuration scanning. We should not be shipping any secrets in code. Everything should be immutable. Everything should be open to scrutiny. And we inject our configuration then in the classic 12-factor style. He says, without using environment variables, of course, because environment variables leak on the host. So an environment variable, as Kubernetes does it, pointing to a file that you can then resolve dynamically. Um, all this really is about making it easy for developers to do the right thing by not allowing them to use the foot guns. And putting this compliance into the pipeline, making sure they have clear, obvious, deterministic error messages, and, uh, and allowing them to remediate these things fairly easily. This is also a classic uh, a case of many heads doing different things. If your organization can centralize these sort of things, then it saves them being re-implemented on a per-project basis, of course. Right, we are now at deployment stage. We have followed all this best practice, and we've got a container that we want to push into production. If we do not use admission controllers to validate all the previous steps, and uh, because we have the immutability of this image, we can tag metadata to it and use it at admission time to the cluster to validate that all our previous steps not only have been passed, but have not been circumvented, that a malicious user with access to write to the Kubernetes API is not able to deploy arbitrary attack code. They would have to, uh, so one of the things that can be done here very simply is to ensure that every image comes from a registry that is defined inside the cluster. So myregistry.controlplane.io, and what would I do there is then, as a, an attacker with access to the API, I would try and run something from the Docker Hub, for example. It does very simple static analysis at um, pod admission time and says, you've got the wrong registry prefix or FQDN. You're not coming in. Um, we'll go into more detail on that later. And finally, runtime configuration. It's all very well to uh, configure these images very safely, but the major difference between um, a virtual machine and a Docker container is that it is so easy to undo all of the security on a Docker container. Double hyphen privilege, you run unconfined without set comp, without app armor, you mount all the host devices into the container. It's, uh, there's, there's zero security there, and it's probably the worst named flag in the history of computing. Uh, right, so with all these things in line, we've got a theoretical nice promotion to production from the developer's machine. But we need to enforce all this governments, uh, sorry, governance, um, and ultimately, we have a very different security model um, from VMs. With containers, we have a single enforcement point when the images are deployed, and we can control exactly what's in the infrastructure. Again, this content addressability, immutable containers. This means that we can scan an image once, deploy it to production, and constantly scan the same version that we have offline in a non-production environment, knowing that if a zero day is suddenly announced, we can scan um, what is essentially a hashed binary um, identical container to what is deployed in production, and um, we don't have to reach into our production environment with those particular tests. So, of course, containers are also layer-based, which means vulnerabilities can hide in layers that are not in the uh, merged UnionFS top read-write layer that the container actually runs from. This is, a, this is a question that different container scanning tools deal with differently. Some will scan every layer, some just scan the surface, the, uh, the top layer. So, um, onto the actual pipeline. At this point, I would like to heavily caveat the rest of the talk by saying a lot of this tooling is either in development or yet to be proven out at any serious scale. However, 
in, um, in typical form, some of this stuff comes from inside Google, where, as they did with Kubernetes and Istio and various other projects, they're open sourcing something that they're using as part of their internal process. So caveats, this is not all production ready. Um, slight double caveat, it is being used. Oh, it's an appeal to authority instead. There we go. So you write your codes. You know your dependencies, security reviewed, we've built ourselves hermetic reproduced builds, we've scanned our images, we've enforced specific requirements at deployment time, and then when something changes, we rebuild and redeploy the image to fix the issue, starting all the way from the beginning. Everything promoted through a pipeline, classic continuous integration. So these are the tools that are playing in these spaces. Um, there are commercial versions of some of these. Uh, we've gone for the open source ones here. Obviously, there are compromises made. Open source versions are generally slightly less fully featured. Um, and we'll go through all of these in some detail. So of course, we know about Docker. We know about the base image. We won't go into any detail there. And we'll start with the update framework and notary. So the update framework is a secure distribution mechanism. It's been re-implemented in various different forms. Ultimately, um, it features uh, offline root keys and the kind of uh, global uh, trusted root store style. Um, it has ephemeral keys uh, to prevent temporal replay attacks. And the idea is that it's built to resist compromise. Um, it's used right now in a few different implementations, one of which is uh, secure updates for um, automotive code. And it has been uh, deployed as notary by Docker. So uh, Docker worked with the, uh, the guy who authored this spec. And, uh, and yeah, and built an implementation called Notary. So Notary signs and validates images. Uh, so through signed collections, it supports software to have relations where versions are dependent upon other versions with survivable key compromise and signing delegation. Um, so and best practice, of course, is to store the master key offline. This is very similar to GPG. And uh, transparent key rotation is another feature. Um, it's kind of an interesting one because I think if, uh, if your organization is breached, perhaps you should admit that publicly. Um, so um, let's keep on going. This is broadly how the update framework works. Uh, it's there for completeness. Um, but notary flow here, essentially what we're doing is we're putting a, a notary server inside the trusted registry, and then we are using that to validate that the keys, uh, that the signing, the, the signed key that we have um, is the correct one when we use that image. This can be enabled with content trust on the, on the environment variable on the command line. At this point, we are ready to scan images. Now, as I said, different things are done in different ways by different tools. Some will just scan installed operating system package manager versions. Other will check file system permissions for all entities. They'll look at application library package manifests, JARs, WARs, TARs, manually installed binaries, malwares, rootkits, backdoors, file system properties, extended attributes, exposed ports, commands and entry points, and secrets. But it is a mix depending on what tool you use. As I said before, this is uh, an, an image divided by layer. What we actually see at the top is the thin read-write layer that then um, transparently presents all the other layers. Different tools do things in different ways, of course. Um, Claire is now uh, from the Red Hat, uh, in the Red Hat family and is uh, due to be under some more active development, having been stagnated for a little while. Um, Aqua Microscanner performs a, a subset of their enterprise feature set, and Anchor as well have an open source version with, with an enterprise upsell. Enterprise scanners do a whole lot more. So Twistlock, Aqua, both add intrusion detection and a host of policy and compliance features. Really, it depends upon your organization's security posture. Um, I would argue that IDS is always relevant as part of a defense and depth strategy. But this is the most important point. We should never be pushing CVEs to production because script kiddies love CVEs. There are published exploits. Metasploits is all too easy. There we go. So pipeline metadata. I spoke about this earlier with enforcement at admission control time. But this is ultimately saying we can take all of this information that's produced in the pipeline and use it for policy decisions later. Now, Graphius is the external realization of Google's internal binary authorization tooling. Um, that is binary as in a binary, not as in Boolean. Um, so an open source project to audit and govern the software supply chain, which is essentially a structured metadata API. It's kind of on rails. Uh, they guide you in a certain direction. Um, and broadly, what we can do here is we can use our image scanning tools 
and we can create metadata which we then submit to Graphius and we have a holistic view of all of our containers. Um, we, I mean, broadly, I could go on for a bit longer about this, but I'll leave these in the slides for posterity. It's kind of how Graphius works. And here is broadly, excuse me, um, a process flow. Uh, again, I won't go into this too much detail because there's not quite enough time. And yes, of course, it's on Rails. Uh, there are some, there's been some internal flux, but it's still moving in the right direction. There is a lot of action on the repository right now. However, you cannot chain together assertions to insert, sorry, to assert the integrity of the whole supply chain, at least not with cryptographic certainty, introducing in toto. So this is from the same place, which is the, the New York Cybersecurity Lab, that, um, that Notary came from, that, that the in tough, sorry, that the tough spec came from. Um, and uh, full disclosure, we are sponsoring this guy's PhD to develop this software. I uh, believe in this very strongly. Essentially, it is the signing of arbitrary events. So you have some inputs, an event occurs, and you have a product. Everything then is signed with GPG keys. Those are backed off onto individual identity. Instead of running PKI, control plane loves Keybase, and we back off onto that instead. And this is essentially validating everything from the user's git commit through each stage of the build chain. Each stage is then signed so that we know we can trace it back all the way to the user who's been using a YubiKey, of course, so they've got hardened devices against compromise. And um, then we get all the way to deployment time, and we're able to revalidate each individual step cryptographically to be sure that what we think we're doing is actually the case. So this, this protects against things to the level of malicious internal actors, uh, which is really an insane security boundary to even be talking about because uh, it's a very difficult thing to protect. So we have these individuals. Um, they're defined in the metadata layouts. Uh, and yeah, there, there's, uh, again, more information in these slides than I have time to go through. Um, but yeah, uh, we're super excited about these tools. They're, they're very powerful. As I say, they are still nascent. They're still under development. This is a glimpse of what we think and hope the future will look like, rather than necessarily what exactly can be done today. Um, and yeah, I, I will still just leave these because I've got a couple more things to get through. In total, and Graphius are, it looks like, going to merge because Graphius doesn't care about the security and verifiability of what it does. It cares more about the metadata that it collects. So the two projects will have uh, an own holy union, perhaps, at some point soon. This is the Intoto flow. And as you can see here, we've backed everything off with a mission controller webhook in Kubernetes. So at deployment time, we're able to verify what we've been doing at build time. And finally, onto a mission control. This is the API server's ultimate test phase. API server receives a call, an HTTP call, because Kubla is just doing HTTP. Some of the calls um, upgrade to WebSockets, like exec, but generally we'll just call it HTTP. We make sure that users who we are, we apply our back to uh, ensure that they can do what they're trying to do. And then we run these webhooks. A mutating webhook will take the pod inputs, and maybe it'll add a service count. Maybe it will remove something that it doesn't like. And then we validate the schema. And finally, we validate the admission itself. This is the point that we can apply policy, because we are able to perform what is essentially static analysis on the YAML. And then once we've analyzed it and said, for example, so a pod security policy is a validating admission controller. Um, so we can extend that to say, well, let's extract just the image name. And because that's immutable and because we've got a tag, let's then go and check that against, for example, our um, vulnerability database. Uh, let's make sure the thing's been scanned. Let's check it against um, Graphius to make sure that it, has, uh, it hasn't got any critical CVEs. And of course, that response from Graphius will change with every new CVE that's released. That may be deployed in an image. So you might be able to apply version X of your image one day. And then the next day, because there's been a CVE released, exactly the same deployment will not work. And you'll have to go back to the beginning of your pipeline. Um, ideally, you wouldn't find out at this point, of course. And uh, you'd be scanning constantly earlier on. Critis is the admission controller for Graphius. And uh, it, again, it is still only, it only works with Google's internal metadata API right now, but it is, uh, uh, again, rapidly being open sourced. And Portieris is from um, some of the guys at IBM, which is an admission controller for Notary. Now, this only supports a small subset of, uh, of 
the, the total hubs, let's say, because people can run privately, uh, the PR for using private registries landed uh, last week. So this is rapidly again gaining maturity. In summary, uh, it's really easy to get these things wrong, and it's really easy to get anything wrong in the whole supply chain. Um, that guy escaped with his life happily. Uh, these are the tools that we think um, will uh, be of use over the next probably three to nine months as they mature. And, uh, and with that, thank you very much for your time.